guest today on Value Engineering Experts is Matthew James, a top-level detailed engineer, and I regard him as also a friend, someone I respect, someone I met a long time ago. And uh, Matthew is uh, the Vancouver Office Manager for Issuant Associates, arguably the leading geostructural below-grade engineering firm in North America, if certainly in Canada. Matthew also is an ex-president of DFI, yep. the Foundations Institute, which many people in the U.S. will, will perhaps want to tune in and hear Matthew's uh, update. And Matthew, my first question, actually, we're going to have some fun. When do you, do you remember the first time we met? Well, you know, I don't know if you can actually call it meeting, but I mean, it was on the football field in high school. You know, I don't think we introduced one another and said, how are you? But uh, yeah, that would be the first time we were sort of in the same presence. But uh, no, it would be uh, then I, for, for me, conscious meeting and relationships started when we were at, at Deep Foundations uh, contractors. And you were, uh, you know, uh, uh, an engineer that had been there for, I'm not sure, maybe four years. And then I was just this uh, first job kid that got out of school and uh, didn't know which way was up and was looking for all kinds of guidance and uh, received that through you and a number of other really important lifetime mentors uh, at that company and friends, lots of colleagues there that are lifetime friends. Great memory, but let's not, let's talk about football a bit. So, <laughs> so I'm going back, I, I wrote it in my book here, 1977 was that yep. game. Yeah. And if you recall, you were on, you were younger than me and, and, yep. uh, and we had painted the goalposts at OT the night before. If you're, <laughs> and so uh, we painted them purple. We came in, and this yeah. is Oakville Trafalgar High School. And then we were Queen Elizabeth Park, and we ran the wishbone. But I believe, Matthew, you were a defensive tackle brought up from the junior team. I was, yeah. And so we might have hit each helmets at one point because I played a little bit of tight end. You know, one of the, I think the mistakes, and one of the things I'll recall from that game was, our coach was very adamant about playing people both ways. And I think, you know, that's, mm. that wasn't really a good strategy because we had injuries. I got injured that game. I actually broke my anterior cruciate. Oh, yeah. And, uh, as much as I wanted to play football, you lived the dream after me. And uh, for the sake of our audience, Matt's pretty humble. But Matt was all Canadian at Western. Uh, linebacker, two years, right? Yeah. And were those years that you guys won the Vanny Cup? I never won the Vanny Cup. I was always the bridesmaid. I'm the Fran Tarkington of, uh, of uh, the Vanny Cup, and that's a tradition my son has proudly uh, carried on. Um, I went to three Vanny Cups, lost them all. And the only other year, we only lost to the winner of the Vanny Cup in the playoffs. And then uh, my son went to Western, and uh, that was the year UBC won the Vanier and then next year my son transferred to UBC and then that was the year that uh, UWO won the Vanier so uh, the changes have successfully avoided winning a Vanier cup I think now five times or six <laughs> um, tell me quickly about your son and I'm going to ask you about the Super Bowl too um, but your son uh, did he play a significant position or did he get to first string like you did or oh yeah no and uh, he was uh, sort of a co-captain at UBC in his last sort of two years he was uh he was a, a tight end he, he moved around he was a great o-lineman but he uh couldn't get heavy enough so you know he sort of went up to 255 260 and just wasn't comfortable there and they they put him at tight end he's got good hands but oh my lord he could block you know, they started him at uh, defensive end, but uh, he really was a, a great blocker. And so I think he had a he had a great career blocking for UBC and uh, did really well. Um, and I thought he would have done a great job in the CFL as a, you know, a blocking back and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, that he's healthy. He didn't have any injuries, no head injuries. I mean, he he got all the relationships and all the fun with no injuries. And so my hat's off to him. He's got a great life ahead of him. He's now addicted to fitness and lifting and exercise, becoming quite a skier. 
And uh, so, uh, yeah, he's, he's lived the dream. He, uh, you know, he's healthy. Whereas, you know, I'm, I'm going in for a knee replacement. You've had shoulder problems your whole life. I mean, it's, you know, and then we've got friends that, uh, you know, we didn't have concussion protocol and I've got, I got friends that are very much suffering CTE symptoms. So it's, uh, yeah. Interesting. Is your son an engineer? Yeah, no, excuse me. No, my daughter is in engineering. Oh, my son, uh, engineering. my son's a solder grad geography He's in uh, development. So it's funny. He's on one end of this, of the, of the spectrum of discussing projects with developers and, uh, and, and uh, contractors and clients. And I'm on the, you know, I'm on the dirt end of it. Uh, so we, 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 we talk to all the same people, but at different ends of the project. Anyway, you, you married a, a pretty smart wife too so you can't claim that they're all your brain cells oh no every morning my kids wake up and thank god for their mother uh they got her looks they got her charm they got her skin tone they you know so uh yeah they're they're real fortunate yeah yeah congrats on a long-term marriage that lasts say hi to maria if you can i will do that so just another one then this did you watch the super bowl oh yeah so i thought it was a great game i mean i, I did thought too. That that guy uh, for LA that made that game saving tackle, what a brute! Yeah, JT Donald, he's uh, he's a piece of work, man. I think he's uh, our height and three hundred and five pounds, uh, and he's uh, you know, just an animal. Bench press a house. I mean, he's a, he's a real unique athlete. And when unique athletes can make those plays in clutch situations, it you know that's what really sets them apart. And he did that. Now jumping ahead to deep foundations. Um, and I think your experience with the Western football team and uh, somewhere along the line, Rob Cameron got in there. And yeah. uh, what was that drinking game we used to play? You showed us, was it Cardinal Puff or something like that? Oh, yeah, I, could, I do not remember. <laughs> you don't remember that. You showed it one time. Remember there was Chris Telecki. We had some great Western engineers because we hired for Oh, them. we did. Yeah. And Alec we, McNabb yeah. started that. And then there was a, there was a troop of about 12 really talented engineers went through there that, as I said, are lifetime friends all over the industry. Yeah, you're right. And uh, anyway, so tell me uh, at Western, what was unique is they had Kerry Rowe, because we're going to talk yeah. about great, great engineers we knew, Dr. Quigley who passed. And yeah. yeah. Um, who, and then Milos Novak, who was my uh, oh, yeah. you know, thesis advisor. He was a great soil structural dynamicist that worked with Davenport at the wind tunnel and uh, really rounded that out on the dynamics side. What was your thesis? Was it earthquakes or was it? No, it was uh, it was foundation and structural interaction pile soil pile soil pile interaction in both linear and nonlinear uh, uh, range. So. Um, yeah, just how uh, multiple foundation elements would uh, would interact with the soil. Yeah. And it was pre-FEA. So we used some really interesting mathematics to model the soil in the half space. And uh, so it was good work. Yeah. Lives on today. So Matthew and I, we work on different cool projects throughout our career. One of them recently that I, I want to mention is uh, the culvert repair. With, mm -hmm. And that's the... FE HD plank and the FE spiral. And, you know, on review, we nailed those. We got full patents awarded on those. And yeah, that's um, great. Yeah. Congratulations. They basically said that they were, they'd never seen anything that unique. And I, I believe that it'll be very useful. I've included that in the six patent package that I'm marketing now to a uh, limited number of the right type of firms. As, as you know, we keep in touch on that a little bit. So great engineers, you know. I wanted to go through this because you've known some real good ones. So uh, I'm going to say, you know, what do you remember about Bill Lardner? Oh, wow. Yeah, Bill Lardner was, uh, you know, Bill Lardner was such a quality fellow. And, uh, you know, really, he was also highly technical. And, uh, and that was his con contribution to the Deep Foundations relationship, you know, with Dave Miller, who was, you know, very much the business you know, a uh, partner of that relationship. But um, Bill Lardner was a, a real quality fellow and very innovative and looked worldwide for uh, technologies that could be adapted to, you know, the Canadian market and was very, very effective at doing that. And, uh, but, you know, he also respected the balance that uh, 
you know, I think Bill recognized that without Dave Miller's input, Bill would have run the company into the ground with new ideas and new things and build this, build that. And as annoying, and literally, and he espoused to me his annoyance upon occasion. But, you know, at the limitations of, you know, both the vision and the wallet of, you know, he and his partner, uh, he respected it. And he, he respected and loved Dave Miller and knew that, you know, it takes two and it takes that balance to get things done. And then, you know, he's the guy that, you know, recognized the talent of, of Alan McNabb. And then that led, I think, directly to your hiring. And uh, boy, when you bat a thousand with Alan McNabb and then Martin Hallowell, well, it gets real easy to sell, you know, bringing in the rest of the guys. And, uh, and he brought in quite a few. And, uh, you know, and uh, so I think it worked out really well for him. Uh, you know, Bill, uh, Bill Stark ended up, you know, staying there and running the firm and uh, expanding the firm's scope and size, you know, I don't know, five, four, fivefold. So very successful. An honorable mention should go to Hugh Peacock. Oh, yeah, Hugh. Hugh is great. Bill great used motivator. to call Hugh and get the, the recommendation. Yep. I think it started with Alan. Somehow they met and it started with Alan. Anyway, uh, that's interesting. So the next guy I'm going to ask you about is Bill Birmingham. And oh. with that, maybe Patrick. Because, you know, Birmingham, a lot of people don't realize this. It was the oldest construction company in Canada. Oh, right. yeah. Sure. It could have been with Forrest. And he, they wrote a lovely book that talks about you know, the great grandfather and Forrest, Bill Forrest and the team up in Goderich and all the, you know, the near shore work that they did and, the, you know, the wave breaks and all this thing and how they built it and, you know, really wonderful. And so it was written by Patrick's, well, um, you know, the whole family got involved, but Patrick's brother, Tim, was sort of the orchestrator of it. He's a lawyer in Toronto, probably retired now, uh, but fantastic family. Uh, Bill Birmingham inherited the company from his father and it was near broke and Bill Birmingham turned it around and got good people around him, Manny Fine, former you know, vice president with DFI. And uh, they did a great job, innovative, uh, invented the vertical travel lead and hydraulic kicker system that really differentiated themselves from the rest of the, you know, the Canadian construction market. And uh, Bill was a, Bill was a great, motivator and empowerment fellow. And um, Bill was good technically, um, not as good as Bill Lardner technically, but uh, Bill Birmingham was fantastic at recognizing that, hey, here's somebody who really knows something. And he's, yeah, yeah, and Bill, you'd hear him say all the time, which wasn't necessarily true, is, oh, this guy's way smarter than me. Yeah, come on, Bill. But um, <laughs> Bill recognized it, Bill hired him, and Bill gave him empowerment and didn't give them a job description. And that's something Bill hated was a job description. You know, if you do that, then you won't do what you think is right. And we're, you know, and, and Bill Birmingham's the guy that really taught me that, hey, you know, Bill paid me to tell him what I thought. And so I told Bill what I thought. And it wasn't always decorative, polite, or appropriate, but Bill respected that. And Bill made it clear to me that he paid me to, you know, to, to, think and tell him what I thought. And then his son, Patrick, wow, what a fantastic fellow. And I can honestly say that I just loved my work at Birmingham. And we developed all manner, we, you know, we, we redesigned the diesel hammers and the systems and the drive systems. And uh, Pat was very much the, the creative inspiration. And then I very much with Pat, you know, made it all work um, and uh, sorted out the details and tested them and, and broke things and got things wrong before we got things right. You know, and Patrick was the innovator that brought about, hey, you know, we want to test piles. Why don't we light a rocket on them and uh, develop the stat dynamic load testing method, which, you know, has, has lived on. And, uh, you know, it was a rocket powered uh, system to load piles at first, but then, you know, we turned it sideways and loaded bridge piers and gave all manner of interesting information to design engineers and, and tested piles all over the world from Egypt to Malaysia, to Singapore, to India, to Korea. You know, I went all over the world selling that technology and supporting that technology. And that's actually where, why I was in Australia when I met up with the, with the, you know, what's probably coming up as a discussion about resonant piling technology. So Patrick was an absolute delight to work with. Every morning was fun. 
every day was funny and fun. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't know anything about electronics. And this was back in the 80s when, you know, uh, you know you, you, we didn't have the electronics that today that, uh, you know, back then. And uh, we didn't know what we were doing, running oscilloscopes, trying to measure things and figure out what was happening. It was, uh, it was a fascinating time and a lot of fun. And uh, so he was a, he was a real uh, inspiration. And I definitely blame Patrick for my passion for equipment and equipment development. And it's a disease I've had for my entire career. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I both blame and thank him for that. And he went on to, you know, Birmingham got into trouble and, uh, Patrick went on to, um, do great things there and, uh, manage the company into, um, a, a, a profitability and a sale to Solnitan Bashi that worked out really well for all the shareholders and his family. And I think Patrick is happily building sculptures somewhere out either up in Ancaster or, or uh, in south of France so great guy yeah it's interesting just to, to add a footnote to Patrick I agree with you on everything you say about Patrick you're a real gentleman he was actually uh, an art graduate so he yeah. wasn't he wasn't a, a civil engineer but certainly when you get yeah he's a fine artist yeah yeah another fellow I'm going to ask you about now Brian Ishwood oh yeah Brian Brian is great mentor brian is a fantastic teacher and mentor for uh what is a generation of young engineers including yourself myself natter and sorry uh just a, 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 a too many to name and uh you know uh, how many times has brian taken a young engineer and had them present a project to them and brian in a most polite but a firm way instructed them how they've everything they've done is wrong and how to do it right and you go into those situations and and brian just takes i mean the a true genius is when you can take something complex and difficult and contradictory and oh if we could do this but we can't because and then you put it in brian's hands and he breaks it down into the simplest you know problems geometry issue and it all falls out and you can see it, you know, uh, uh, forming the solution before your eyes and you walk away and you go, how did he do that? How did he make it so simple? Why couldn't I see that? And Brian was one of those guys. And it all started with, you know, a young engineer coming to Brian with a problem and their form of a solution. And Brian taking a new sheet of paper and instructing them on how to draw the problem to scale and to understand the fundamentals of the problem. And uh, he was just a brilliant teacher that way and could make, as I said, these simplest of pro complex problems simple. And uh, so he was just, he was just lovely to work with. And I had the pleasure of doing it for 20 years. Now he left the firm in capable hands with Natter, who's another sure. guy wor worth commenting, but but Brian, is Brian still alive? Brian is, yeah, Brian's um, unfortunately fading. Uh, he had some health issues, physical health issues, um, and that's definitely slowed him down. And then, as you know, I mean, uh, my parents are, well, my father's passed away and my mother is near. Um, when you're not whole, when some aspect, either be physical or intellectual, when, when those things start to fade, it seems to accelerate everything else. If you're not a whole person, then you, things seem to drift away a little sooner. And so I think Brian's suffering from, from that. It's just, you know, good old age um, that catches up with all of us. And so Brian's suffering from that. But uh, acute and um, uh, sharp, for, for, you know, well into, you know, just until very, very recently, you know, he'd come into the office and, and help out with some young engineer and some young engineer got a real treat. I know he taught me an awful lot. Oh yeah, how to conduct myself and and a lot a lot, a lot of simple lessons. And for the benefit of the listeners, Brian Ish, Brian Ishwood and Bill Lardner were very close. Mm -hmm. I think that they they changed the industry, and uh, mm -hmm. that that was quite a quite a example of design build done properly. You know, humble professionals, honest, honest. Anyway, uh, we covered your. Uh, 
your family. And I uh, wanted to ask you, let's go to the, uh, quickly, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but you're, you've got a couple patents, right? Mm -hmm. And that's for resonant, maybe just explain the RTI concept because it was a knife through butter. And, and I think it's important that people understand, you know, your thought process on that RTI uh, venture. Yeah, we, um, we developed a high frequency vibrator and the intention of the vibrator was to actually dynamically excite a pile. And so all things have a natural frequency. And so if you are able to excite something at the natural frequency, then you can get um, oscillations that multiply. And so think of a, a swing. So you put a kid on a swing and we've all done this, you push a kid on a swing and you find out that very quickly after just a couple of pushes, you get this high amplitude. Let's just as a game, switch that around and take, you know, say my six-year-old son or when he was six, uh, put me on the swing. And uh, my son pushes me a few times on the swing. And before you know it, I'm swinging above his head and he's just a little six-year-old boy and I'm a 235 pound man. How does he do that? Well, he's putting energy into the system at the resonant frequency of the system. So he doesn't push when I'm coming back. He pushes just after I start going forward again. And so he's, he's adding energy into an elastic system at the perfect moment to gain resonance. And that's the power of the system. So imagine if you can do that, you know, with a glass of water and a singer's voice. You know, we've all heard of, you know, a, a sing, singer with the frequency hitting just the right frequency, being able to break a glass. It's the same thing. You excite it at its natural frequency, the amplitude, the oscillations and the amplitudes grow until you actually exceed the strain capability of the material. We wanted to do this to piles. And there was a group that had done that. The Russians had done it many, many years ago, and they actually developed the first vibrators. And it was from resonant vibrators that they developed conventional vibrators, low frequency vibrators. And so the Russians tried that. But so did a guy named Ray Rusi and the Shell Oil Company, and they tried to create a high frequency, small oscillator machine, and they were successful. And that is the the, that is the fatherhood or the beginning of the sonic drill, which you've all seen. There's, they're all over Toronto, Vancouver, all over the world, really, with Port Longyear. And they operate at very high frequencies, and they can reach the frequencies that will resonate a drill string in the ground, and it has advantages. Problem with them is that they don't limit the amplitudes. There's a force modulated system, which can be a problem. That's where you get galloping oscillation and failure of the system. We developed a system that was a hydraulic piston and we could tune it to the natural frequency of the pile using an algorithm, very brilliant algorithm developed by an Australian electrical engineer, lovely fellow named Dave Green. And we could control the amplitudes for various reasons that I won't go into. And we could resonate the pile control the amplitudes, use actually a very small amount of force to vibrate the pile, create large amplitudes and drive the pile into the ground. What we weren't aware of is that when you operate at high frequencies, you can actually drive a pile into the ground with no ground vibration transmitted into the ground. And so we actually could drive a pile and you put a glass of wine glass next to the pile and would drive the pile into the ground. It wouldn't even get a ripple in the wine glass. So it had great potential there. And uh, we built resonant drills, we built resonant pile drivers, and uh, they're all in use today. But we did have a number of problems. And one of them was in the big pile drivers, we had hydraulic cavitation that occurred in the hydraulics, which is a nasty little beast that uh, we were able to creep up on a reduction of, but never a solution for. So that remains a problem in the equipment. It wasn't as bad in the, high, in the uh, sonic drills that we built or the resonant drills that we built. And they're, they're off uh, working today and we're still actually working on improving them and getting them uh, more ubiquitous in the industry. But it was a heck of a lot of fun. And I learned, I spent 20 years doing it, learned all manner about uh, high frequency and uh, hydraulics, which you know is a, is a range really you only get into in fighter jets. Um, and those guys don't talk much. <laughs> Um, you know, you got to get into the jet propulsion laboratory to really get some answers there. But it was an incredible amount of fun. And uh, uh, we developed some neat products. 
Yes, I remember when when your when your world you know slipped back on that one because you were at Bauma and you said to me that somebody was going to back it that pulled their corporate backing yep. idea. And uh, I, I'm just going to mention to the the audience that uh, it would probably be something to grab now uh, from the investors who sit around a table and talk about why Matthew went to work for Issuit, but <laughs> which I get because uh, you're making a heck of a contribution to the industry now, I gotta say. Thank you. And there's very few people that I would pick to do detailed engineering. The beauty of Matthew's uh, skill set, initial skill set, is that they're close to the contractors and they're able to, uh, particularly with the equipment, understand when they're being bullshitted, for lack of a better word. Mm. And, uh, you know, I know that your bar is very high. And when we look at our proposed way to, to lower CO2, you know, and achieve a lower cost and schedule, that, that was your going to be your resonant hammer because you could put more in in a day. And this type of idea, we share that idea. You know, how do we get an advantage as a contractor? You know, Patrick Birmingham got that. You got that. And uh, you have to be on both sides of the equation sometimes to get that. And uh, so uh, we got to put one more plug in for Ishwood. So Natter and Sari, can you comment on Natter? Because he's oh, yeah, he's one of my favorite people. Absolutely, and that you know what makes him a favorite is was so much more than just the engineering. I mean, he first and foremost had the benefit of a brilliant mentorship from Brian Ishwood for more years than any of us had the you know benefit of, and uh, more intensely as well. So you know. Thank you, Brian, for, you know, molding such a gift to our community. Um, but I think Natter, whilst being a very, very talented engineer, really bright guy, um, uh, as well has that talent of taking complex situations and simplifying them so that the rest of us can understand them and see the solution. You know, he's very talented that way, but much, much more so. Uh, you know, Natter has a personal or emotional IQ that is very rare among people of our uh, uh, profession. Engineers are infamous for being geeks, you know, and, you know, whatever the plastic lining on the shirt pocket with, you know, and we're, and, you know, <laughs> come on, we all, we all own a whole bunch of that. And we all can see that in ourselves in many different ways. And uh, I certainly had it, you know, I, I had to go and get an MBA to learn about all the uh, corporate organizational behavior side, personal side, all this sort of thing to understand, you know, many of the things that I was experiencing but couldn't realize. And, you know, Natter sort of scoffed, well, why would anybody want an MBA? Well, Natter, we don't have your emotional IQ. You know, we need to be taught these things. We need, you know, tools to help us with this. And again, I think that's what is really phenomenal about Natter is his, um, his people skills, his thorough enjoyment of uh, personal relationships. He strives to improve every personal relationship he has, and he's got a talent for it, and he thoroughly enjoys it. He sees the good in everybody and is uh, talented at bringing out uh, those things and more from people. And like Bill Birmingham, he has this lovely ability to empower people. And uh, once they feel empowered, he supports them. And, uh, you know, what great young talented people can do when you give them opportunity and support, you know, that's a, it. Uh, it's wonderful things come out of it. And he's, uh, he's done that. He's created a fantastic culture at Isherwood. It's probably the most attractive thing to me about the entire company is uh, the way the people interrelate, work with one another, create teams and work on a, work on a really um, plainer level. You know, uh, there is, uh, he limits hierarchy and uh, I don't have reports there. Um, I have colleagues and I very much hope that my colleagues and Natter's colleagues look upon me as a colleague and not, you know, their boss, right? He's, he's very successful in creating that. Yeah, I agree. And uh, a couple of famous Natter expressions for me are, you know, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You've heard that one. I don't know if you've heard that one. <laughs> yeah. 
That's yep. a good one. And, uh, and you know, Natter is probably the best guy in Toronto to have an espresso with. Oh, yeah. Well, he's got time to listen. He used, he uses his own acronym for sure. And uh, he's a great listener. Oh, and a food lover. I mean, yeah. yeah. If you I mean, can, yeah, we all want Natter to publish a Natter approved restaurant guide. I liked him when he had the Volkswagen Beetle. I think he used to have Volkswagen Beetles, but he's, uh, unlike yourself, he's, he's, uh, he's got a big staff, uh, bigger than what you have in Vancouver. I think you're, you're definitely eating at the edges of Geo's Pacific's, uh, fine yep. effort at relationship building. And, uh, you know, in terms of the patent packages in the West, we're, we're basically di dictating a little bit of that because we can, and we're saying that Turan, Troy Zagonis and yourself would be our acceptable designers because, you know, it's a, it's a QA regime we're after. I, I'm a big believer that QA is very important. Mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, we have uh, waterproof shotcrete developed. Uh, the tests are proving out. And uh, the good news, and it's hard to keep track of some of the good news in my life these days, but the good news is uh, that Sika is going to take it on. Oh, so good. They're, they're going to take on the Aquagel, uh, Admix, the E5, colloidal silica. Those two together are giving me a, a test results at John Belkowitz's lab. 4,000 PSI results with a 3,000 PSI cement content. And, uh, and we put mag oxide in those other two in Fangmix 1. And we're, we're seeing complete dimensional stability. I also put basaltic fibers in, which is something we came up with on the culvert repair for the mm -hmm. Tremi. That we're going to put that in at five millimeter basaltic rope. Surprisingly cost effective. It's really a glass bar that doesn't need cover and won't rust. So I recommend Meta Design, my friend David Lawn. And it, to me, it's all about trying to get the best practical guys which might pick the best system. And engineers don't have to always be from a university. They can be people like Patrick Birmingham. What, what would you say is, uh, are your goals now, Matt? I mean, you know, other than trying to give your family the time for Ishawood, how do you see your market share today in Vancouver? And uh, what, what do you think is gonna happen with, with FEH2O lock, which, we believe we're going to change the nature of the sea can industry in North America. And we'd love to have someone like yourself who probably is capable of carrying some of these designs into the States. Do you have, uh, does it, Ishwood has the ability to do work in the States or you certainly Absolutely. know a ton of people, right? Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, I think what's interesting about that technology is, you know, that um, it can provide a constructible thin, if you will, uh, system to uh, create a, a waterproof foundation. Um, and what's interesting about when I say thin is, I mean, a secant wall, a slurry wall, et cetera, et cetera. These are, these are 600, 800, 1,000 millimeter thick systems, um, very constructible, um, but, uh, you know, they occupy a lot of real estate and um, they're not perfect. They're generated underground. Um, and just as an example, if you went to a concrete formwork guy or group and said, oh, would you please create a waterproof wall for us? And we'd like it uh, 40 feet high. And um, we'd like you to put a cold joint every two meters, which is what you get in a, in a slurry wall or every meter or less, which is what you get in a, in a secant wall. Well, the concrete suppliers would turn to you and say, he or she would say, you're crazy can't get a 100% waterproof wall with a cold joint in it. We have to do X, Y, and Z, and it's a high risk, and we don't want that risk. And yet, this is what foundation people are being asked to do all the time, to create waterproof barriers with cold joints that we develop 40 feet underground. So the H2O lock is really interesting because what happens? We excavate down in sections, open up the wall, provide a groundwater collection system in behind it, and then using a unique concrete product in the open with workers that have excellent access, create these panels and 
make a truly waterproof system and then can come back and put admixtures on or other layers of such a you know h2o log product and create a waterproof system and it's more constructible than you know these other more physical large machine type uh, foundation systems so you know what i think it it does is it combines the brilliance of access as you excavate and create the panels with a superior product that can um, make up for this problem of cold joints and so that's i think what's really interesting about what you're doing and and how it's going to be used in the future now is it for everything? No, absolutely. No tool is. You know, if you've got a lot of water in the ground, you're going to have troubles controlling that water when you're making your panels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you know, it's got it's got phenomenal application in numerous systems that are going to make it very, very interesting and takes up less footprint uh, with high quality workmen and product. You're going to achieve your goal and create. You know, waterproof basements which is and especially with the opportunity to eliminate the what is now you know we we put in a foundation system and then they build a whole new wall in front well you're going to eliminate that wall and uh, uh what a savings that is to, and and again money or the cost of those walls is while significant it's not that that's not the impact it's the schedule savings that you create by not having to do that wall and losing seven days every single you know uh, 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 piece or parking slab it's uh, it's got some real phenomenal uh, potential i look forward to asking you'd probably be one of the first guys that i would ask about uh, slab to wall connections and whatnot and uh, you're right it can go that way you know a two acre bathtub two acre raft slab let's say in Toronto, which is a misguided attempt at regulating uh, something on a treatment plant, it's, uh, it's going to save $10 million uh, for a developer. And uh, somebody who's leaning in, but is our friend Tobin, Jerry, by the way, mm -hmm. he, he's caught wind of it and he's tired of the 20 secant prices he's facing in Toronto. So uh, by making it a select opportunity with firms that have good engineers and, and good uh, equipment, uh, I think we're going to have a conversation tomorrow morning, and I'm, I'm quite sure that Tobin will see that advantageous in Vancouver as well. So we're just going to go per province, and, uh, and we're going to be a fraction of the savings on one job. They'll pay for a three-year right to, to my patents, a group of six. So I, I, I wrestled a lot. I sprayed it around and asked people's opinions. And, and I was a long time creating. I think in two years, I did 12 patents. But, the, you know, my thing is I'm very concerned about earth honoring systems. And that's what drives me. And uh, I think you naturally get it. You know, uh, when we look at our, our choice for engineers, Ishwood is always my first choice. And I hope that... Uh, Natter and you were able to uh, be on the first job. You know, we did the bow tower. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, called a, a Berlin Wall by some definition. And uh, Natter was very much involved in that. And uh, it was a success. So, you know, what I'm reserving the right to do to assure you as, as well as, as the patent holder, I'm going to make sure not only that I match the Bentonite waterproofing standard of 15 years and get rid of that $15 a square foot waste of money. I'm going to get involved in the soil selection process. So in other words, mm -hmm. give me a typical borehole, right? And, uh, you know, there might be a role for Ishwood to do that and, uh, and almost be a, a second set of eyes and, and a profitable set of eyes, I would think. Uh, Natter's not afraid to charge, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's, uh, he's done well and, uh, you know, he deserves everything he's got. And I like his attention to the instrumentation. You know, these things have to be monitored. One of the things that developers that are listening would get is the fact that uh, when you drain the water, then you don't have, you have lower anchor loads. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, an interest to develop some of those typical uh, designs with you, Matthew. And uh, the thing I like about Matthew, to put a plug in for Ishwood Vancouver, Matthew, is a prolific engineer and if he believes you're onto something and you're not just smoke and mirrors then you know you'll have a very good idea whether he 
buys in or not within 24 hours. And sometimes Natter can't get to that speed, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people can't get there. And I'm sure as the senior designer, I'm going to say you are the senior designer with Natter. He must rely on you a lot. I mean, Mm -hmm. people in Toronto, he's down in Peru right now, right? So he's saying, well, call Matthew. I'm pretty sure there isn't too many people like Keith Stinson would ask you or you must be pretty busy on zoom these days yes. or is it mainly a phone that i prefer a phone myself you know i don't know that visual you know the, yeah. the ability to to bring up a document and draw lines on a page uh that that i find very effective especially with the you know the the toronto projects and getting over a drawing really really helps so zoom zoom we've really really uh embraced which yeah. is funny i mean i think that 80 percent of the time zoom covers what you need as you well know, if you're extending beyond the norm, if you're selling somebody something that's a different idea and novel, you need to be in the same room. You need the body language. You need to understand what they're not seeing, what they're not understanding, so that you can take the time to explain it more, more um, in depth or um, in a different manner or use another analogy. Um, it, uh, you know, we, we've been very, very successful with Zoom, but it's those 20% of the situations where you need personal contact to really read the situation and understand how to um, convince someone of something that they're skeptical about or don't understand. And that's where, you know, you still need that in-person communication, which is so valuable. Yeah, I find it interesting how some people will put their picture up there. I thought you were going to do that today. Tell you, <laughs> oh no, I'm just I'm just slow with technology. <laughs> well, I am. I can relate to that. I, uh, I, I, you know, because I spent 40 years as a contractor of different types. I, uh, I never really got the interest in the detail design. By the way, Keith, Keith Stenson is really excited to learn the detail design from from Ishwood, and it's great to great. see somebody that we mentored him. Right? Yeah, together. Yeah, he- he speaks very highly of the time at HC Matcon and uh, really enjoyed it, learned an incredible amount. And he's really uh, holding on to those lessons and bringing them over to the design side. And it really guides, influences the decisions he's making from the get go. So it's a real benefit for him to understand that, you know, as we often say, hey, some poor fool has to build this. And that really needs to be honored and appreciated when you're designing you know with with a pencil on paper uh, bill birmingham had a great you know quote on the wall at birmingham construction for that and it was uh, i can't remember it offhand but it, it you know it was by a man named marowa and he said that uh, when a designer is working on a project he is alone with his paper and his pencil and his slide rule dates it a bit, but they have control over the situation. And when you're a contractor, you do not. You have pulleys that buckle, you have chains that break, and you have the mutiny of the men and the attitude that they bring towards the, the, the structure. And you have the wrath of the gods because the gods forever uh, dislike the accomplishments of men. And so, you know, it really put into perspective that, you know, when you're alone with your paper, you can imagine things and uh, design whatever you like and not can't necessarily be, be built. But when you're actually building it, you've got to sort out how you're going to sequence, how you're going to get everything done. And it's extremely difficult and challenging for all these reasons. And, uh, you know, that, that's something that we always take uh, to our projects is, that you know this has to be buildable what's the constructability and don't put a person into a position where they may not do their best job i avoid uphand welds i don't want some person lying on the ground looking up with weld splatter flying all over them in order to get a weld that if i redesign this system they're going to be in a downhand they're going to be better it's going to be cleaner it's going to be um, more effective and it's going to be easier to inspect right just a real simple thing right there that carries through. The ultimate solution to sustainability is, is the tradesman who works safe and the engineer who works safe. 
and both of them have an interest together to help each other. And I think that that's what we've seen through our career, Matthew. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make one more question about great engineers and it's gonna touch on Women's Week. We have Women's Week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Uh, can you talk a little bit about Dawn Tattle? Cause I think she was oh. an amazing uh, force in the Toronto industry. And uh, today, you know, I think she even helped out at Issue It for a while, right? Absolutely. Um, Dawn's unique. Um, and Dawn's a good engineer. She's a great engineer. She never pursued being an engineer, you know, as a, uh, you know, as a designer, that sort of thing. Um, she was very much a, a contractor engineer, really understanding all those principles of how do you get stuff done, really understanding how you're going to build this and the people side of it and surrounding yourself with good people. But oh my gosh, have you ever tied yourself into one of Don's spreadsheets? <laughs> the way, I mean, her capacity to think everything through and then to an organized manner and have all of those variables covered and understood is um, quite phenomenal. I, I think that her relationship with her father must have been quite something. And, uh, you know, the two of them teaching each other, because, you know, I mean, Dawn didn't just start out that way. She was well mentored and uh, was in the field and, and uh, learning how to do things and, uh, and growing. But then that immense capacity she has to understand the, the multiple aspects of the work and to bring them together in an organized fashion and have all the answers must have blown her father away, something else. And, you know, so she's, she's a real talent. And, uh, you know, and somebody, funny, yeah, that's keep the one if you got more to say. But oh, yeah. she, she had yeah. a great sense of humor. Well, she still does. I mean, and I can remember very well walking out of a meeting when I was with Birmingham and one of the Birmingham bidders, and, uh, and Dawn was there and we were doing a JV of some kind. And then Dawn said, oh, I got to go. I'm closing a 10,000 case on project, you know, in two hours, I've got to get the bid in and walked out the door. <laughs> I turned to this guy, I said, oh my gosh, you know, are we bidding that? And he looks at me like I'm an idiot. He says, oh, come on, Dawn, there's no 10,000, you know, case on project. Dawn just says that to all the competition because they're going to think about what they're missing, you know, and then she's on top of stuff they have no idea about. So she sure got me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's pretty sharp. You know, when, uh, and, and to touch on her part of her formula at Anchor Shoring, uh, Tom Stock, yeah, who, who was a real gentleman and, and Gord Stock's uh, son, he uh, and I got along pretty good because we did jobs cooperatively throughout, throughout my career. And, and I asked, I asked uh, Tom after he sold, I said, uh, you no, know, what was Dawn like to work with, right? Mm. And you know what he said to me? She wasn't easy, but she made me a lot of money. So <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. That that says a lot, right? Yeah. I made a comment on a ADSC magazine thing that was Women's Week. And uh, and I put a little tribute there to Dawn because uh, I didn't know her that well. We because I was always in the field and then I was her competitor and, and, uh, but I think she had a certain amount of respect as, as did, uh, like another good guy. And one more, we got to talk about Dave Rumble. Oh yeah. Let's talk about Dave Rumble because he did. Mm -hmm. well. Yeah. And very detailed guy. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then sold his firm. A lot of companies have sold. I mean, yeah. you were, you and I were talking about the fact that Southwest has sold who bought Southwest by the um, Southwest Contracting? Yeah. No, I yeah. think that's still employee owned. I wasn't aware that they they were uh, purchased. The Vancouver Group. Yeah, I think so. I, I uh, noticed, well, you gave me a name to follow up because I think they're the type of company oh, that, would, that we would well, like to. Uh, no, no, no. The three original guys sold to the next group of three guys coming through the company. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so I like employee owned for sure. Yeah, and they still are to my knowledge. Don't quote me. Very good. Well, listen, Matt, we've been uh, yep. about 50 minutes and uh, you got to get on this billable time because you're not allowed to sell me, send me a bill for this. So. Oh, uh, really? Oh, then it would have been a lot shorter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks again and uh, wish you, you and your family the best. And, uh, and to you. Thanks, yeah. Martin. It was a great Take pleasure. Care. All right. Take care.